Welcome to another episode of The Nonprofit Show, everybody. I'm thrilled you're here. Today we have a really exciting guest coming to us from Atlanta, Georgia. Rafi Norberg is joining us as the president of Nexus Marketing, and we're going to be talking about something that's really, really interesting. And if it's not of interest to you, it should be. Being an industry influencer in the nonprofit sector and what that might look like, what you should be thinking about, and actually how it works. So Rafi, um, we are thrilled to have you. Hold on while I do a little bit of my housekeeping, which includes reintroducing myself if we don't know each other. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd. I'm going to tell you, I think she's out camping somewhere, not in, in the desert southwest, someplace much cooler, but she'll be rejoining us on Monday. We are here because of the immense uh, support that we get every day, 830 plus episodes from our presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These folks have a mission that's your mission and they want to help you achieve your mission, vision and values. So check them out. Like Jarrett says, not right now at the end of the show, find out what they're doing. We also have the super cool, sexy app that the folks at the American nonprofit Academy created for us. And you can find us there every day. If you hit that QR code, we will notify you every day with just in, within a couple hours. Um, once the show is up and you can also search those databases, you can find us on any streaming broadcasts and now also on podcasts. So however you like to consume your content, we're with you and the, the nonprofit show um, continues to grow and go with you. Okay, Rafi, thank you, thank you for taking this time to join us. Talk to us about Nexus Marketing. Yeah, absolutely, and thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. So my role is the president of Nexus Marketing. So I started the business almost 10 years ago at this point. And I run a really unique marketing agency. So what Nexus does is we are specialized primarily in digital marketing uh, for businesses that are trying to reach different mission-driven audiences. So most of the clients that we're working with are looking to get in front of nonprofit professionals or get in front of uh, professionals that work at uh, associations or uh, education groups such as schools and universities. So... In order to achieve that, one of the areas that we focused a lot on as a business is really trying to get to know different mission-driven markets. So trying to help companies enter into how do you get in front of a nonprofit professional or a professional who works for a healthcare organization. And in order to do that, one of the, the big accelerators to success is trying to understand the ecosystem of influencers and thought leaders in each of these individual mission-driven sub-markets. So where our agency spends a lot of time, and we've got a whole team dedicated to this, is reaching out and connecting with different uh, quote unquote influencers within the market to try and figure out where their win-wins between different brands and mm -hmm. themselves. And are there opportunities for brands to support these different influencers or vice versa uh, to uh, help get in front of people in a way that is educationally really interesting and useful and helps achieve both the influencer's goal, but also the brand's goal. So by doing that, we have developed this really big network of different influencers that we will go to uh, oftentimes to try and help get our clients uh, broader exposure, but also support some of the objectives that the influencers are going for. So I guess as someone who has spent a lot of time thinking about what is it like to be a digital influencer within a mission-driven space. I probably know a, two, a, a thing or two about it or certainly seen some lessons learned over the last 10 years within yeah. these markets. So I'm excited to talk today about what do we think about when we talk about influencers? What do they look like? What are the behaviors that they do? How do we measure it? So happy to jump in wherever you want. Well, I, I love this concept and I love, um, I love where you are because we were talking in the green room. The word nexus is such a powerful, underutilized word, and I love where you're moving with this. But let's talk about this value. Um, uh, and I, I'd love to get your opinion both directions, from the influencer, but also from the nonprofit. What is the value to us in the nonprofit sector as getting getting somebody and creating that partnership, if you will, with an yeah, influencer? 
That's a great question. So like you teed it up, I, I think there's value for the individual who is becoming an influencer. And then I think there's value for the organization um, as it relates to trying to find people who whose advice you want to listen to and you find interesting. I'll start with the organizational side. So from an organizational side, I think that one of the really interesting things about the evolution of certainly social media um, across across different sectors, both personal and professional, but we'll stay focused on the nonprofit sector, is now we're getting to uh, hear about different voices of what people are experiencing and what people are learning beyond the traditional institutional channels. So for instance, if we were to rewind uh, 20 years ago, uh, you know, there were a couple main publications in the nonprofit sector, like, you know, the Chronicle. And yeah. then, you know, the concept <laughs> of an influencer would oftentimes be someone who worked at a large nonprofit, maybe, maybe one of the biggest, if you're in education, maybe one of the largest state universities or an Ivy League, or uh, with some of the, the cause-based organizations, just some of the, the larger organizations out there, and they would speak at conferences. And I think that that still exists today. But for a lot of nonprofits, they're not really hearing from someone who represents them. So if you're not working at one of the largest, biggest, most well-funded, complex nonprofit organizations, the challenges that you face on a daily basis are different than someone might face if they were working for a St. Jude's or working for a uh, University of Georgia. So one of the nice things about the proliferation of different quote unquote influencers for individual nonprofits is I think there are far more voices of people who can represent different perspectives, both from organization size, from organization cause, but also uh, from what does the individual sound like? So uh, are there people who come from different walks of life, from different backgrounds, who are experiencing a different perception of the nonprofit sector or different challenges or different wins in the sector that now other people can go to uh, to get advice from and to learn from? So I think on an organization-wide level, finding people whose advice you really like and uh, tuning into what they're saying can be just a helpful point of learning that you can use both for yourself if you're in a position of leadership at the organization, but also if you're a leader across your organization. So maybe you have your whole organization tune into a specific influencer because you really like their content. Right. As far as on an individual basis for being an influencer, I think that it it varies a little bit on what you're looking for. For me, you know, when I think about influence as it relates to Nexus, my hope is to help benefit the organization helped to grow Nexus by being a speaker on different topics related to mission-driven digital marketing. And I think for some individuals based on where they are in the organization, it's very a very organization-wide goal that they're trying to achieve. But for sure. others, I think it's a really interesting professional development tool for you to build your own audience that is separate from maybe the, the organization that you're working for that you can take with you as a professional asset across your career. Right. And, you know, that's very controversial. We every Friday we do an ask and answer episode where people, you know, write in, they call, text, email, whatever. Um, stop us, you know, when we're out and about. And that's a big thing, asking about where is that balance between becoming an expert for my nonprofit versus my industry or my sector. Right. One point eight million nonprofits registered in the U.S. and nine major sectors. You know, there's a lot of movement there, and sometimes um, that can kind of cause some jealousy. It can cause some problems, um, and it's it's a it's a really interesting thing that we need to probably drill down in another episode. But I want to ask you this question because if you are part of our audience, it's like, yeah, I want to get out there and I want to advocate for my sector or myself or you know, professional development, which I loved that you brought that up. Where are influencers showing up and what are these platforms? I mean, we saw this tremendous disruption for speaking, public speaking and public gathering during the pandemic, which pushed us into, you know, the digital sphere even faster. Now that we're kind of moving through this, what are you seeing and what can we expect? That's a great question. So <clears throat> uh, I think you still have your classic channels. So as you think about people who are going to who are going to provide information to you that is interesting or, or places you might want to speak if you want to be an influencer, mm -hmm. I, I think there's the classic channels of in traditional press and for conferences. I think uh, especially for 
the nonprofit sector uh, and in in the subsectors as well within that. I think there's for each subsector there's there's a string of different conferences that's relevant to that sector that that realistically if you're if you if you're trying to look for people to get advice from or to give advice to those people showing up in those sector specific areas I think is still very relevant. Beyond that, I think as you mentioned there's been a proliferation of new channels to get out there. So I'll split them into two categories. I think there are the channels that you can own yourself, and then there are the channels that you still need to get onto. So for the channels where you need to get onto, the interesting thing that I've seen is a rise in new media, for lack of a better word, related to the sector. So think about all of the different podcasts that have launched out there uh, and all of the different um, types of webinar series, podcasts, shows that are out there that are specific to the nonprofit sector. And I think that a show like this, for instance, where you guys are hosting people every single week to talk about different yeah. topics is a great place to find different folks with interesting perspectives or to share your perspective if you've got something unique to say. The other area that I would say is is worth people thinking about is LinkedIn and their own website. So uh, when when you're looking for different pieces of advice, I find a lot of the advice that we see come through related to the nonprofit sector is now being shared via LinkedIn on an ongoing basis. Because even if you're prolific and a great speaker, there are only so many shows, there are only so many places that you can be on and they're, and they're happening sporadically and they're scheduled out months in advance. But LinkedIn is a channel where you can share your perspective at any time you'd like and it is ready for immediate consumption by the people who are who are choosing to follow you. Mm -hmm. So LinkedIn is a really interesting space to look for different ideas or to share your own ideas and see what people are engaging with and, and what finds an audience. And then beyond that, I would also say either if you're finding influencers on LinkedIn or you're trying to become an influencer yourself, having a personal website where you're sharing some of these thoughts mm -hmm. uh, via your website and then starting to build your own channels, whether that's email or uh, blogs on certain topics. I, I think that having a source of truth that you fully control when it comes to your perspectives or when you're looking for perspectives, having a source of truth you can go, go to beyond just what someone is going to share in a podcast is really, really helpful because then what you can start to see is the perspectives, not on just a single topic that that person happens to be talking about or the single post that they shared, but the whole body of their work, which may cover many more topics than you get to in a single show. Yeah, and I love, I mean, of course, you know, from my vantage point, in my daily world, the control issue, control of content. Hello, that's huge. That's absolutely huge. And I love that you address that because, um, yeah, controlling that message and being able to move with that message, um, messaging, I think is really powerful. So I love that you put that spin on that. Um, and I also think that it, it's really um, portable so that if you do leave a particular organization or you, you know, you make a different choice in your, your career, um, you still have that content and you still have that connectivity. I think that's really wise. Let me ask about this. And this is one of those big time questions. It's like super hard and super difficult. We talk about this all the time, but how and can we, sh or should we measure influence? I mean, this is like one of those grand mysteries to me, Rafi. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's tough to answer because it varies. Yeah. <laughs> As we think about influence related to the nonprofit sector, I think ultimately it, it comes down to what are the goals that you're trying to, to drive forward. I think for the clients where, that we work with, where we're trying to connect them with influencers, ultimately what's driving their perspectives is is revenue generation that can either be measured directly or indirectly. And then on an individual basis, I think you need to decide what your goals are. I think that uh, for for most individuals who are trying to become an influencer in the, in the nonprofit profit sector, if you don't know what you're trying to measure on, whether that's number of followers, number of newsletter subscribers, uh, number of donors to your organization, then you're going to find it very difficult to prioritize the activities that you're going to want to work on. You're not going to stick with it, quite frankly, because you won't be able to say, see incremental improvements into okay. what you're doing. So, so I think finding a point of measurement is incredibly, incredibly important. Beyond having just a single point of measurement, though, 
I do think one of the nice parts about like quote unquote influence is that it cannot perfectly be measured. Uh, a lot of our work happens to center around search engine optimization. So how people are finding your website via Google. Uh, and, and that actually is quite measurable of, of people like hitting your website. But even thinking about SEO in the grander scheme of someone getting introduced to a brand and interacting with that brand, it's rarely, very rarely someone searches something on Google, they go to a website, and then they decide to take an action, whether that's that's donate or, you know, a, get a software demo or something. There are eight touches that that person interacts with. So I think if you're going to decide to dedicate some time to being an influencer or connecting with influencers, you have to have a core metric that you're going to say, this is how I'm going to judge success here in order for any investment of time to make sense whatsoever. But beyond that, understand that no single metric is perfect. So just like you were talking about, Julia, uh, Julia, right before we jumped on this idea of like someone recognized you in an airplane and it was a little disconcerting. That's yeah. something that can't be measured, but to me is a leading indicator of engagement with the influence that you're having. And I feel the same way about what we're doing, where uh, sometimes we're on a podcast and we won't know if anything comes from that, but then two months later, someone will say, hey, I heard this thing that you were on. Isn't that great? Yes. That's very cool. So I, I think you've got you've to take measurements with a grain of salt and just understand that not everything is going to be perfectly, perfectly measured uh, in, if you're going to embark on one of these campaigns. But the reason I, I do think you need some metric underlining uh, underlining what you're trying to do is that any individual channel, when it comes to influence, whether that's LinkedIn posting, writing blog posts, sending out emails, they're all a gigantic investment in time and thought and, and reputational risk, quite frankly. Yeah. So if you don't have an end goal in mind of what you're trying to do, then then, then it's not going to be a great use of your time. So for me personally, I'll give you an example from my own life. I think there's inherent value in uh, Nexus as a brand, getting in front of different people and talking about digital marketing within the mission-driven sector. I don't think there's a ton of people talking about that. And what's the metric that we're measuring off of? This year, it's the number of opportunities that we get to talk about different things related to our sector and our expertise. So we're not measuring like an end-stage outcome, if that makes sense. We're measuring the uh, the just a, a an outcome of the number of events we get to participate in. And that's an okay metric to measure too, because then we know what we're going for is we're trying to speak more places, we're trying to share more thought leadership, and then we're going to reassess at the end of the year and say, here's what came from that. Did we think it was useful? Did we see anything? So it doesn't have to be like number of donations or number of people subscribing per se. It could just be for the first year you're doing it, number of blog posts written or number of LinkedIn posts shared, and then you refine your measurement the next year. But at least if you have some type of thing that you're going off of, you have a way to evaluate, did we take a step forward in this direction or did we not this year? Right. You know, I think it's really profound. What I'm learning from you first and foremost, which I think is the way to a successful life personally and professionally is defining your, your goal, right? I don't mean to go all Tony Robbins on everybody, but you got to set, you got to define your goal, number one. But I love that you said, you know, look at the action of what's going to take you to your goal. So I have a follow-up question to that. And that is, do you pick one thing like your number of engagements for Nexus marketing, which I love what that looks like, but do you have other subsets or are you just focusing in on one thing? That's a great question. So for us this year, the things that we're starting with is uh, we want to do one LinkedIn post a week on a topic that we believe can get some engagement. And we want to try to uh, get on more speaking opportunities than last year. And last year, I think it was like two or three. So so it's it's a pretty low bar to, to increase. And those are the two things, right? We're picking LinkedIn, and then we're picking some of these other channels where you can go and talk to people. And for the influencers I've seen be the most successful, I think they are quite focused in what they choose to 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 really drill in on as a as a channel that they're working towards. So, for instance, just to give you an example, if one of your goals is to become um, a speaker at conferences, what I will see people do is they will uh, really go out of their way to try and create a great relationship with the professional associations or the conference planners that are putting on that conference. So what does it look like for me to have a really great interaction with AFP this year? And they're going to be the one organization that I'm going to work with. I'm going to figure out something and I'm going to do something at AFP. I'm not concerned with doing something at um, AFP and Bridge and AHP 
and you know ASAE, I'm just going to focus on the single show and really knock it out of the park. Or alternatively, on LinkedIn, my big goal is to become an expert at LinkedIn and really be someone when I post, people are engaged with the content that I'm sharing and really drill it down into that as a medium. Because each of these mediums is hard. That's why there are so few influencers that crush all of them. So it's better to crush a single channel than it is to be mediocre at all of them. And I think a lot of people, when they're saying, I've got a perspective, I want to share it, are trying to do everything all at once. And it's too hard. It's too hard as an individual. It's too hard as an organization to do everything really well. So I would, I would recommend focus uh, for a really long time until you feel like you've mastered that specific channel. Okay. So two things, Rafi. Um, we uh, take our show, the nonprofit show, to AFP, and we broadcast live. We've done it two years in a row. Uh, Mike Geiger, the CEO of AFP, um, generally comes on and kicks off things. Um, and so I'm just giving you an open invitation. Uh, next year, show up, and we will put you on. Generally, we're there for two or three days. I love it. And we get different people in. And so, yeah, so... Put me down as one of your, you know, placeholders for your public engagement pieces. And yes, we'll get okay. You off. It, we'll might not, it might only be five minutes, but you will be on the nonprofit show. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, thanks for that invitation. <laughs> well, I love what you're saying because to me, Rafi, um, sometimes we have guests on, we talk about this internally within my own company, um, and it, it's just so overwhelming. And then I think what happens when things become just too overwhelming you're like screw it i'll come back to that and so versus defining your goal really having that you know time to figure out what that goal is and then moving forward in a in a really profound and deliberate way it's much easier much much easier to i think achieve it right so i love what you're saying I want to jump into this other question and discussion, and we don't have a lot of time, but what are the requirements to becoming an influencer? Um, because I think a lot of times we feel like, oh, I need to spend more time doing this, or oh, I'm not a CEO, I'm, I'm just a, a this or a that. Um, I've only worked for one organization. I haven't founded an organization. I'm giving you all these excuses that so many of our viewers and listeners are probably running through their own heads right now. But what should we look for when we are looking to, to really move into this, this, this opportunity? Yeah, so this is a great question and a somewhat controversial question too around what, yeah. are, what are the things that would qualify you yeah. to basically give advice to other people on a given topic? Um, I, I think a, a requirement that is not so much a professional requirement, but I think an important self-requirement is know 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 what you're trying to achieve by doing this and and believe at your heart that it's it's worth the time to go out and put the effort in uh to go and do this versus the other places that your time can go because i think one of the things that people see is they see uh, people who already have large audiences or they see some engagement with the audience but what they don't see is the dozens or hundreds of thousands of hours of work it took to get there and it's a brutal slog to build an audience. And the most successful influencers we've seen have been doing it for years. And sometimes they are totally crazy with what they're willing to do. Uh, one of our clients who who I would consider an influencer, they they wanted to be a speaker at AFP or they wanted to to do some you know AFP related content and AFP didn't want to sponsor them. So what they did is they actually paid for a video crew to come to AFP and for them to do their own set of interviews, which then they gave to AFP to just use. Uh, and that was how they became part of the AFP ecosystem. But it, it was thousands of dollars and more yeah. than that in time out of their own pocket to do it. Wow. But that's commitment. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that that is kind of a prerequisite of becoming an influencer is to say, what am I trying to achieve? And am I willing to put time into this versus the other things in order to make progress in this specific area? The other thing I think is worthwhile is really getting a good handle on what is the perspective that you're looking to share with others and, and where where are you really a specialist and qualified to give advice? Mm-hmm. So for instance, as it relates to, let's let's take someone in the, in the nonprofit sector who is... Uh, a major gift fundraiser at a uh, animal welfare organization. I, I think a good place to start is to say, what have I learned that is specific to people in this role at these types of organizations or things that I'm thinking about uh, or ideas that are interesting that I, that have helped me a lot related to my specific role at my specific 
type type of organization and even though that audience is relatively micro like how many major gift officers are there at animal welfare organizations i don't know are there are there a hundred are there a thousand maybe somewhere between those numbers but that is a place to get started where someone someone's advice would be really be really well heated especially if that is an area that's underserved with good advice related to how do you make progress in it so i, I think people you know you look at like your your biggest podcasters out there and you say well how do i get an audience of a million people or 10,000 people but you can't start there you just need to start with an audience of 100 people who are interested in what you're saying or 1,000 people and i think the best way to do that is to pick something you actually know really well and are qualified to share a perspective on and i don't think it needs to be like advice per se. I think it can just be uh, right. sharing your perspective on something or things you're thinking about in relation to a very specific subsector. You know, Rafi, I'll tell you, um, when we started the weekend that the pandemic occurred and there was the, the federal close down, um, that really came on a Thursday. Um, Jarrett and I had both lost all of our speaking contracts, which take years and years to get. Um, I came up with the idea to put on a show that we would do from, she had a home studio, I had a, an office studio, and on our first broadcast, we had four people, and two of them were each of our moms, right? <laughs> okay? And now we get 2,000 people a day coming to us through all of our channels that we've, we've created and cultivated. That's taken a long time, and it's still growing. It's still an evolution. So you are right. It doesn't happen overnight. And a lot of people will be like, wow, you're such a success overnight. You know, it's like, yeah, no, every day <laughs> it's a slog every day. And now we're in it in our fourth year, right? Yeah. yeah so yeah. I love what you've said is that you have to look at this as a, a journey because the arc, you know, it really bends and you have to be willing to um, make that investment, that sacrifice and be confident that you are on the right, you know, the right path. I mean, I know that that's what we've done. And I know that there are days when I think, what the hell, you know, what, why am I doing this? Because uh, it is a slog to every day do a show and get it going, get it, getting it up there and on all that. But um, I love that you caution us about that overnight success because um, it, it's not necessarily there. And it's, if, you, if it is, it's not consistent. I think that's the other thing. You know, when you when you invest and you build that reputation, um, it it lasts longer. Wouldn't you agree? Than yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, it, it takes a long time to build great things, and it takes a long time for things to slowly degrade if 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 work still isn't going into them. So I think for for people who are looking for influencers to follow or trying to become one themselves. I think people who have been out there for a while sharing their perspective, it, it shows a certain degree of consistency with a willingness to be there over the course of a long period of time. And if you like getting advice from someone and you like the perspective someone's sharing for them to be there, not just today, but a year from now, sharing their advice on different topics, I think is really helpful if you're going to choose to spend your time following someone. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've already got a million questions and, and, and more reasons to have you back on, Rafi, because there's some other things that you said that I really think we need to explore. And so uh, to our viewers and our listeners, I think we're going to uh, make Rafi Norberg one of our new best friends, president of Nexus Marketing, nexusmarketing.com. Check them out. The, the website's really interesting because his team is, is quite um, immense. And if you look at what they're doing and um, what they're in charge of it and, and what that workflow is. It's absolutely fascinating um, and very achievable, I think. You know, I mean, there's a, there are a lot of great minds behind these these concepts and these actions, but some of the, the gems I took away today was, you know, setting a goal, defining what that is. You can narrow that down and then to really look at that goal. What is it that's going to help you navigate towards that and kind of, cut out the rest of that noise, which sometimes is really hard to do. So I loved Rafi that you said that. Again, Rafi Norberg, uh, president of Nexus Marketing. It's been just a wonderful thing to have you with us. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd herself, will be back with us on Monday. Again, our thanks to our amazing sponsors and friends at Bloomerang American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. 
These are the folks that join us day in and day out. We're at about 830 plus episodes. And uh, most of these folks have been with us from the beginning. Um, when I thought maybe this would be a two week gig and now we're, <laughs> we're in year four. So just having to say that is the slog that Rafi has been talking about with us today. Rafi, I love, love, love your energy and your comments. This has been a lot of fun for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, as we like to end every episode, we want to remind ourselves, our viewers, our listeners, our sponsors, our guests today to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.